We're, we're going to move straight live to California, if we can. Can we pull uh, Dr. Glazer up on the screen? Um, uh, Dr. Glazer's research and teaching interests include transnational Jewish literature and the literatures of Ukraine. She's the author of Jews and Ukrainians in Russia's Literary Borderlands and will share her perspective on how recent events have affected and continue to affect Ukraine's Jewish population. Uh, Dr. Glaze, I don't know if you can see the audience. You've got about, uh, it's about 120 individuals staring at you on the screen. Uh, so we can hear you. Uh, uh, and just, if you can't see us, you can see you've got 120 captivated eyes staring at you. Okay. Uh, well, thank you, first of all, for including me in this briefing. Um, for me, it's been very educational to hear the other speakers, and I appreciate all of your thoughts. So my thoughts will be based on a combination of my research as well as conversations I've had with friends and colleagues in Ukraine now, and this includes especially friends in, in Kiev and in Kharkiv, but also in a number of other cities. Um, the protesters on the Maidan and also on other cities equivalents of the Maidan Nizalezhnesti independent square uh, were extremely diverse. Among the first to die on Kiev's Maidan was an Armenian and a Belarusian. Among the dead uh, was a Jew who had fought in Afghanistan with the Soviet Union. Ukrainian Jews who had emigrated to Israel came back uh, with their training in self-defense and actually trained some of the protesters in self-defense. Uh, there were, of course, a number of ethnic Ukrainians as well as ethnic Russians. Um, so uh, despite the fact that many of us have heard about right-wing support of the protest movement, by no means was there a majority of protesters um, on the far right. One thing that's remarkable, I think, about Ukraine is that it's an incredibly multi-ethnic uh, area, and Professor Finden has already talked about this. Russians, Jews, Ukrainians, Poles, Tatars, uh, Romanians, and a number of others share a common and somewhat tumultuous past. And the interim government has, I think, done a nice job of emphasizing this extreme multiculturalism. So my specialty is in the relationship between Ukrainians, Russians, and Jews. I'm a literary historian, much like Dr. Finnan, and I'm interested in how these groups have described one another, um, and also how they've borrowed from one another, primarily in fiction. But I'm going to talk today about how the relationship between these groups sheds some light on, on what's happening today. What I think is especially relevant to this multi-ethnic history of Ukraine is the argument that the revolution in the Maidan was propagated by fascists and neo-Nazis. Um, and the main argument that Russian officials initially used for moving into Crimea hinged upon the idea that the new Ukraine is dangerous for minorities, including for Russians. And whether or not Russians should be considered a minority group is, is perhaps debatable given the large number of them, uh, but I, I, would, I would count them as a minority group. President Putin, Foreign Minister Lavrov, the UN ambassador, all cited alleged concerns about neo-Nazis, fascists, and anti-Semites. In fact, in the first press conference after moving into Crimea, Putin described the fear that Ukraine's upcoming elections in May um, are going to yield some kind of fascist or anti-Semite who, who will pop out like a jack-in-the-box. And this kind of rhetoric, I think, is not, as Angela Merkel would say, the ravings of someone who has lost touch with reality. Um, I don't even think it is what uh, the New Republic editor, Julia Yaffe, has, has written a kind of Dadaist performance. I think it's actually very clever. I think that Mr. Putin is tapping into historical concerns about the dangers of Ukrainian anti-Semitism. First of all, this gets at Westerners' fears of the rise of Nazism, and this is especially an important fear among West Europeans. No one wants to be wrong about supporting a new Ukrainian government. So at the very least, Putin forces the West, uh, as well as Russians who may trend towards pro-Western sentiments, to hedge its bets and to acknowledge uh, neo-fascist elements. Second, I think statements like this connects the idea of historical Ukrainian Jewish antagonism. And this goes back to uh, the Khmelnytsky uprisings in which many Jewish lives were lost, uh, as well as to 19th century pogroms. Um, so it forces uh, the idea of historical Ukrainian Jewish antagonism uh, 
um, to be connected to this idea of present-day Ukrainian nationalism, both then and now. And with it, it forces us to connect a history of anti-Semitism uh, to today's Ukrainian self-determinacy. And it, it forces people to consider that this may be bad for Jews. And there are at least, let's say, 80,000 Jews living in Ukraine, probably more, um, to uh, extend this as well to Russians. And I think Julia will be able to comment um, in particular on, on what the realities of, of this are for Jews living in Ukraine today. Um, and here, Mr. Putin is appealing to Western Jews' mistrust of Ukraine as well as to their mistrust of, uh, of European nationalism. And I'm not talking necessarily about Jews in Ukraine, but Jews living in the West. Um, the comparison is problematic for many reasons, um, but what Putin is doing is attempting to li liken a Russian diaspora to a Jewish diaspora. Uh, third, Mr. Putin is setting himself up as a savior of ethnically oppressed, even as he moves into Crimea, which is a move that isn't welcomed by Crimean Tatars. So by ethnically oppressed, he's actually talking about, again, Russian speakers living in Ukraine. Um, and fourth, of course, some Ukrainians in the East do want closer ties to Russia, and it's important to acknowledge this. But from what I have understood from the articles that I've read and from people I've spoken to, this tends to be for economic reasons and not for racial or ethnic reasons. So in actuality, as I've mentioned, the Maidan movement has been uh, has had a lot of support. It's garnered a lot of support from Jews as well as other ethnic minorities, particularly living in Kiev, but also in other cities. Um, here is what people fear, and I want to um, make sure that, uh, that that we don't whitewash actual support that the Maidan movement has had um, from right-wing movements. Um, well, very briefly, I know that my time is, is close to up, but I, I wanted to just say that people often tend to trace historical tensions between Ukrainian Jews and uh, Ukrainians to the Khmelnytsky uprising, which Dr. Finnan has already mentioned. That was the uprising in 1648 uh, against the Polish overlords. There were, of course, many Jews who were uh, supporting the Poles, and many Jews were, were killed in the process. Um, there were a number of Jewish chronicles that were written right after the Khmelnytsky uprisings. Um, uh, stating that this was one of the one of Jewry's biggest catastrophes, um, and indeed it, it was. Um, the other thing that uh, uh, Jews and Ukrainians tend to trace antagonism back to is the existence of the Pale of Settlement. When Catherine the Great annexed more portions of uh, of Poland into the Tsarist Empire, Jews were limited to to living in the Pale of Settlement, and there was some. Um, difficult coexistence between Jews and Ukrainians, particularly in the late 19th century. However, I want to note that um, what's happening now and what's been happening really throughout the 20th century, but especially since Ukrainian independence, has been uh, an extraordinary amount of collaboration between Jews and Ukrainians. Uh, Julia will talk more about this, but you saw Jews getting up on the Maidan. Uh, prayers for peace were offered up by um, by rabbis. There was an open letter to President Putin signed by many of the leading uh, Jewish figures in Ukraine. So you actually see very strong support for a westernizing movement among a number of the country's uh, minorities. Thanks.